because we are kings and our words matter. If you tell me God makes people sick, that I could never agree. I could never see the point. I, I could never, I could never compromise on that. You know, you can tell me a thousand other reasons, but you can't tell me that God gives sickness. The God that I know through Jesus Christ is the healer yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> He's the healer. I love you. I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you, I lift you up, and I magnify your name. Say it out. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. We need to be careful about how we talk about God. We can't just put all the blame on God, you see. I was driving down the road one day on a motorcycle back long, many years ago. Somebody was preaching seven points on why people are sick. So I stopped and uh, said, let's hear the sermon, you know, why people are sick. So I went through six, six points, you know, uh, pretty, some pretty good points, you know, about sin and about 
disobedience and not obeying the natural laws and all of that you know give some good reasons and all then finally the seventh reason i was uh, about to go because i was in a hurry i said let's listen to the seventh one also let's complete the sermon you know and i listened and listened to the seventh reason it shocked me he said people are sick because god gives them sickness and it's a healing meeting I'm not joking my friend it's a healing meeting and he says god gives them sickness i can imagine all the sick people there sitting there wanting healing coming to him afterwards says tell me first of all is this sickness god given or you, you know infection problem <laughs> what is it because if it's god given you can forget about it you got to keep it because it's god given see people conveniently say things like this but uh, see i i understand sickness comes in this world from all directions you know you can give me thousand reasons about sickness and why it comes and how it comes i can agree with you there are spiritual mental emotional physical uh, reasons and even more reasons beyond that uh, as to why we get sick you know you don't have to research much you know you just drink some water you get sick you know it just comes just like that you know sickness comes so easily because it's a fallen world ever since adam violated god's laws and allowed satan in he turned the devil loose into this world and the devil brought all sickness and poverty and all of these evil and the world is full of it today so i can understand i can understand that the world is like that it's an imperfect world and people get sick for so many reasons people get sick but if you tell me god makes people sick that i could never agree i could never see the point i i could never i could never compromise on that you know you can tell me a thousand other reasons but you can't tell me that god gives sickness the god that i know through jesus christ is the healer yesterday today and forever <laughs> he's the healer he's jehovah rafa He's a healing god. He is known and famous for his healing powers. That's the god I'm preaching about. So let's think about this. You know this guy says Paul was very sick, he had ophthalmia and uh, and god given ophthalmia. And he went to God three times, not once or twice, three times. God said no, nothing doing. And God said my grace is sufficient for you and then he gives the interpretation of what that means he says it means my grace is sufficient for you means the clergyman says that it's not god's will for you to be well god thinks it's better for you to be sick than to be well god does not want to heal you it's not god's will for you to be well therefore my grace is sufficient that's what my grace is sufficient for you means to him and then paul says in response to what god said paul says when god said my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness then god paul says most gladly therefore i will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me so paul now glories in his sickness he says and glories in his sickness means to him he writes this he gloried in his ophthalmia he gloried about his pus coming out he gloried about the condition of his eyes he gloried about that and then the next verse says therefore i take pleasure in my infirmities pleasure so he glories and then he takes pleasure in his eye condition now i don't know about you i've never seen anybody that's really sick really glory about their sickness you'll see them in the best hospital sitting waiting for the doctor to see them so that not so that they can glory in their sickness so that they can get rid of this sickness they'll tell the doctor it doesn't matter even if it costs 5 lakhs i'm ready to pay can you get rid of this sickness 
Have you ever seen anybody glory in their sickness? <laughs> Everybody is trying to get rid of their sickness. So having said this, he concludes. And this is the concluding words. He says, in the quivering flesh and painful suffering of this apostle, of his apostle, the Lord has written his divine protest against this unspeakable doctrine, this brutal transmutation of the cross of Christ into a center of physical healing. This is his concluding words. Can you believe that? <laughs> means that god by giving paul the sickness and refusing to heal him telling him my grace is sufficient for you has conclusively said there is no healing for anybody today don't count on the cross as a healing center you can't count on jesus christ to heal you that's what he says but really this whole passage is not about that at all it is about how a messenger of satan is sent to buffet Paul wherever he goes, give him persecution. When you take the word thorn in the flesh, see this has become such a popular term, thorn in the flesh, thorn in the flesh. You know, they, people use it for everything. One man was saying, my wife is the thorn in the flesh. flesh. <laughs> At least he was half right because thorn in the flesh always refers, wherever it appears in the Bible, it appears a few times in the Old Testament, it appears and it means or refers to only people, not to a disease. God told the people of Israel, he said, if you allow the Canaanites to survive and live among you and don't completely drive them out, if you allow them to stay with you, they will be like thorn in your sides, he said. What, is it, what did he mean? He meant that they'll be causing you trouble all the time. When you got a thorn in your feet, you know, you don't feel peaceful at all until you remove that thorn you can't rest because it will be always pricking you and paining you and all of that. So God said, if you don't get rid of these Canaanites, they're going to be thorn in your flesh. Later on in Joshua, we'll give you the references, Numbers 33, 55 and Joshua 23, 13. To, in Joshua's time, God said again, if you don't get rid of these Canaanites, these nations, they're going to be thorns in your sides and in your eyes. They're going to be troublesome. They're going to be causing you trouble. David said in his last words, he said, the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns to you. In other words, they'll give you trouble. That's what it means. So the thorn in the flesh referred to people and never to a sickness. And even when Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the flesh that he had, he tells us exactly what, in the, th what the thorn in the flesh is. He says, a thorn, a, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. What is it? The messenger of Satan to buffet me. He could have said thorn in the flesh called ophthalmia. No. He could have said thorn in the flesh. Some kind of a disease in my eyes. Maybe if you didn't know the name. The preacher knows it better I think. He says exactly. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And it was the messenger of Satan to buffet me. A messenger is an angel. The word is angelos in, in the Greek language. It appears so many times. It's always translated as angels or messengers. So if I send somebody to you, he's a messenger. He's, an, he's coming from me to you. So the devil has sent someone from his side to Paul to keep at him and to keep giving him trouble. That is the whole meaning of this passage. Thorns are personalities. Thorns are demonic or human personalities in the bible that's how that's the way the bible talks about thorns but here this man says thorn in the flesh is disease to buffet me he says rotherham's translation translates it like this that he might buffet me he uses the word he there indicating that it was a person weymouth translates it like this you know talking about how he prayed to the lord three times uh, to uh, to uh, that it might depart from me. In English it says, it might depart from me. Weymouth translation, a very famous New Testament translation says, I, as for this, three times I besought the Lord to rid me of him. 
the word him is used referring to a person they all clearly indicate that this is a person a demonic personality that is there to trouble paul by causing trouble through people through other people so very simple but the devil is so cunning and crafty he doesn't want us to see the whole point in this passage second corinthians 12 7 as soon as you start reading about thorn in the flesh every traditional christian's mind is going well thorn in the flesh paul had one it was a disease i've heard somewhere you know they don't know where they heard it and they don't know if it's in the bible you show me in the bible where it says it's a disease they they don't know where they heard it they don't know where it came from they've heard it and they believe it they think it's a thorn in the flesh so when they get sick or something like that they immediately claim that it is a thorn in my flesh brother just like paul was given a thorn in the flesh i am given a thorn in the flesh <laughs> but it's not talking about that at all it is talking simply about how the devil gives him trouble through persecution and how paul counted upon god's grace to put him over the trouble that the devil gives him See, there are many questions in this area that you need to consider the bible says god wrought special miracles through paul there were several apostles it was never mentioned that god wrought special miracles through them only by paul god wrought special miracles you know the bible says paul believed in healing paul believed that god is a healer he preached it whenever he preached people got faith to be healed that's the kind of person he was secondly is exclusive healing ministry at lystra and melita and all these places you know as on his way to rome they get stuck on in the island of melita and people were sick there and everyone that came to him he prayed for and they were all healed what kind of message he would have preached you think he was a great believer in healing that god is a healing god paul's teaching in the new testament you consider paul's teaching in the new testament the passage that we read just before communion you know he says some people are dead and some people are sick today because they do not discern the lord's body why does he say that he says that so that they can be saved from that sickness saved from trouble that's why he says it romans 8:11 he says if the same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwell in you he will also quicken your mortal bodies he says He is the one that talks in 1 Corinthians 12 about the gifts of healings as one of the gifts the nine gifts that God has given to the church. So I can go on and on like this. And they have taken this Paul and made him to be a promoter of sickness rather than healing. Paul was a great promoter of healing wherever he went. He preached about Christ and what Christ has done for people and people received great healings and miracles things happened in his ministry that's the kind of person he was he was never propagating sickness or promoting sickness sickness comes for so many reasons sickness is there in this world and so on you can give a thousand reasons but to say that god gives sickness is wrong to say that it's a thorn in the flesh given by god is never in the bible it is not in the bible at all you can look at that passage again and again and again what paul is saying is all right if god's grace is sufficient for me to handle this devil and all of his opposition then i therefore will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me when he's talking about even infirmities he's not talking about sickness he's talking about the fact that he is standing alone in the midst of the opposition he says the power of christ rests upon me i take pleasure in my infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecution distresses for christ's sake for when i am weak then i am strong he's not talking about some kind of uh, some kind of a uh, uh, sickness or anything like that he's talking about his troubles his persecution that he goes through and he says right in the middle of it i am strong because jesus is with me amen acts chapter 20 verse 22 and then second timothy chapter 4 and then we are done just read that to you acts chapter 20 verse 22 behold i go bound in the spirit unto jerusalem not knowing the things that shall befall me 
save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. See, God is helping him. He's telling him in advance that persecutions are waiting for him. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Praise God. That's the kind of approach we must have. He says, I don't count my life even dear unto myself. Why should, see, that's why Jesus said, don't be afraid of the people that can only take your life. Because the giver of life is your Lord. Even if they take your life, he's going to give back your life and you will live eternally in glorified state with him. That's the approach Paul had. He was not even afraid of death. He was more than a conqueror. He refused to be defeated. He refused to be cowed down and put down and, and be discouraged. Even death is not threatening him, he says, so that I may finish my course with joy. Look at his focus. I want to finish. And the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, I don't even consider death as a threatening thing. I want to finish my course. I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that has been entrusted to me and finish my course with joy. He was focused on that. Turn to me, turn, turn with me to 2 Timothy and I'll read this. This is the end of Paul. He comes to the last days of his life and he writes this. He says, watch thou in all things. He tells Timothy, a younger minister, he says, end your afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of, my, of thy ministry. For I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He's talking about not departing to some other town. He's de departing from life. <laughs> you know, his, his end of his life has come. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. These words are very famous words. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. What does he mean by fought a good fight? He means the devil all the time tried to discourage me, lose hope and give up. But I fought a good fight. I stayed on till the end. I never got put out of the race. I never got defeated. I stayed in the race. I fought a good fight. How many of you are fighting the good fight, my friend? The devil wants you to drop out of the race. I fought a good fight. He says, and I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. Persecution did not finish him. He finished his course. Don't worry. I'll tell you no matter how much persecution you get, when you keep going forward doing what the Lord has called you to do, you will finish your course. The persecution will not finish you. He finished his life. He was ready to go. He finished everything that he had come to do. He had been called to do. He said, I finished my course. I have kept my faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Amen. Everybody, let's clap our hands. Clap with me if you can. Your love is everlasting, it's an everlasting love. Your mercy is as new as every rising of the sun. And your loving kindness, your loving kindness, better than life. Your grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Your power and your glory are forever on display. And your loving kindness, your loving kindness is better than life. Oh, it's better. Oh, better than life. Oh, so much better. Jesus, your loving kindness. Better than life. Fairest of ten thousand. Fairest of ten thousand, of ten thousand, you are fair. And nothing in this world could ever measure or compare to your loving kindness. 
Just, oh Lord, you're just in all your ways And I will lift my hands, oh Lord With gratitude and praise For your loving kindness Loving kindness better than life Oh, it's better His loving kindness to us. Think about how He has been good to you, loving to you. Sing this with me. Jesus, it's your loving kindness is better than life itself. Better than life. 